A tale of betrayal, imperialism, and a 7,000 mile trip to the pub. This is Beer Geek. Today, IPAs. Irritable pant agitation. Ingenious pencil arrangement. Incandescent prescription aspirin. India Pale Ale. This episode we're going to cover everything we can to do with this king among beers. I'm drinking my all-time favourite IPA, Thornbridge's Jaipur. Thornbridge itself is a fantastic brewery, and their other IPAs, Halcyon and Wild Raven, are also supreme IPAs. And once again, beer geeks, it's time to go back in time. Much like me, the IPA is over 175 years old, but the PA part is far older. Pale ales are ales that have been brewed from a pale malt. Duh. This type of malt accounts for the majority of UK ale or bitter grists. Grist? Grist is a grain that has been separated from its chaff in preparation for grinding. Chaff? The chaff is the dry casing that surrounds the malt. Surrounds? No. no surrounds. It, it surrounds it. Everyone in the 18th century is loving their pale ales. Like me. At this time, however, they weren't particularly hoppy and they were still quite dark. They were dark enough to be confused with the other beers at the time. So when a brewery released a pale ale, people would call it a bitter just to differentiate it from a porter. By the mid 18th century, most breweries were using coke fired malt. Coke is a type of fuel with few impurities and a low ash content. This new process produced much less smoke and roasted the barley in a more subtle way producing a much paler brew. 1757 and Britain has just won the Battle of Plassey. Yay! This battle marked the beginning of British rule in the Indian subcontinent. The British East India Company was set up primarily to trade with the East Indies, although they ended up trading with China and mainly India. At their peak, this company accounted for half the entire world's trade and they mainly dealt in commodities such as tea, silk, cotton, opium. Opium? Opium. Opium? Uh, yeah, yes, opium. The company was the main driver behind British expansion in Asia, and by the 19th century, most of India as we know it today was under British rule. This opens an entirely different kettle of fish, and I don't want to get into imperialism right now. There's a great crash course video by John Green up here. All right, John? No, you can't hear me. And if you've got about 14 minutes to spare, it's well worth a watch after this. Onward to the beer! The British in India wanted beer. The British in Britain had beer. Freight. The first brewer to send across beer to India was George Hodson from the Hodgson's Brewery in Bow. This brewery itself was very near to the East India Company's ports and became the beer of choice to send across to the subcontinent. The main beer they would send was what was known as an October beer, similar to an old beer. One that's aged in a cellar for several years, and it's quite dark. When it arrived in India, it was met with unrivaled success. By 1811, Hodgson's son Mark was sending out 4,000 barrels of beer to India a year. That's more than 10 a day. 10 years later, Hodgson and a lad called Drain had an idea. Cut out the East India Company and send beer to India themselves, taking 100% of the profits. The cost for sending beer to India was pretty much the same as sending something from London to Edinburgh. Drain and Hodgson set up their office in London, cut off all ties with the East India Company, bumped their prices by 20% and would only accept cash. The East India Company officers were fuming. They'd lost one of their primary investments and the merchants in India weren't too happy either because any other brewery that they'd buy beer from would just be priced out of the market by Hodgson and Drain. They were so confident in the quality of their product that they didn't think anybody else can compete with them. It's 1806 and the Napoleonic blockade has blocked all trade from England to mainland Europe and Russia. It caused trade exports to fall by up to 50% and the beer industry fell to its knees. In Burton-on-Trent, Ben Wilson, the town's main brewer, was really struggling with this blockade and he was forced to sell his beer to Samuel Alsop for £7,000. He's rich, I think. Probably not. The East India Company caught wind of this deal and invited Allsop to dinner to discuss a potential trade agreement. The East India Company told Allsop that they could match any sales he was getting with Europe and Russia. 
in India. And that evening, Allsop signed a deal with the East India Company to produce a strong, well-hopped pale ale for export to India. Hodgson and Drain caught wind of this deal and laughed it off as a mere small-time competitor. But what they couldn't account for was the power of nature. What nobody knew at the time was that the well water in Burton-on-Trent was rich in calcium sulphate. This gave beer a much more natural bitterness and better flavour compared with anything that a London brewery could do. It would take up to the middle of the 19th century before brewers could figure out how to Burtonize their water. And up until then, Allsop knew he would always have the better product. The first consignment of Allsop's beer went out to India in 1823 and was met with a great response. This Burton magic didn't remain a secret for long, however. Bass and Salt, two other main breweries in Burton, caught wind of this, started producing their own type, and between Bass, Salt and Allsop, they began to whittle away at Hodgson and Drain's market share. The firm that was synonymous with the creation of Indian pale ale fell into obscurity, and by 1933, the Bow Brewery was demolished to make room for council flats. Damn you, god of beer. There are a few myths to be busted. Can we say that? Myth busted? Myth busters. Don't think we can. I think we're in trouble. It was said that IPAs were significantly stronger to other beers at the time. This is in fact a myth, and, if anything, were slightly weaker. The beer was well fermented and strongly hopped, which does give the impression of a strongly alcoholic beer. Oh, it's not too alcoholic at all. The main myth with IPAs, however, is that Hodgson originally formulated his beer to last the long journey, and that the hoppy nature of IPAs meant they had a natural preservative, meaning they could survive long journeys at sea. WRONG! So wrong! What even... what's wrong? WRONG! It's not true! You don't need high alcoholic beers or well-fermented beers to last longer. They were sending porters to Australia and India at the same time and they were arriving in perfect quality. The original beers that were sent out would have been aged in a cellar for two years and so the fact that they were kept in a hold on a ship sort of matches those conditions. But there's nothing about the qualities of the IPA that made them more of a preservative. It's not true. It's just not true. It tastes like the sea. IPAs are dominated by the hops chosen from them. The main hops used in British IPAs are Fuggles, Noble, Target and Golding. IPAs are commonplace now among supermarket shelves and every brewery from here to Burton has have tried their hand at producing one. It is a true shame that the birthplace of the IPA is no longer here, although we do have Burton-on-Trent and its rich brewery heritage from Worthington's, Marston's, Salt, Bass, Allsop, Boddington's and Ind Coop Plus, the town is the home of the National Brewery Centre. I'm off to Burton. Where do I go? That way, Burton. IPAs are legendary. Massive scope for experimentation and huge bursts of flavour from the first sip to the last. Every pint of IPA tells the story of months at sea battling beasts and bad weather for one purpose, to deliver that unbeatable first sip of an India Pale Ale. Cheers, George. Thank you for watching this episode of Beer Geek on IPAs, and I hope you enjoyed it very much. If you're wondering what I thought of my beer, the Thornbridge Jaipur, I loved it. Always have. And the best thing about it is this aftertaste of just an explosion of hops that you do get with most IPAs. If you wanted to watch my Belgian beer guide, you can find it down there. And if you want to find out all about Arthur Guinness and the first ever champions of industry, it's just down there. Don't forget to subscribe, guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.